Um, our next presenter um, is one of the regular presenters at our conferences. Brings a new, new Archer. and interesting uh, uh, topics to us. Um, uh, the presenter is uh, Whittem Reed, who obtained his BS and MS degrees in electrical engineering at the University of Alaska in Fairbanks. Uh, he's worked as a professional engineer and engineering firm owner operator in the airline and telecommunications industry. Um, he did that for more than 40 years, and now he manufactures electronic equipment used in radio astronomy and does design work on the long wavelength array. He's also a part-time space weather advisor for the High Frequency Active Auroral Research Program, which everybody knows as HARP, and he is a member of the HARP Advisory Committee, uh, which has been a SARA member since 2008 and uh, lives in Anchorage, Alaska. Um, he's a lifelong resident there. So, Whit, thanks for uh, giving us another really interesting topic uh, to consider. Go ahead. Okay, good. Um, can everybody hear me okay? Oh, I must be muted. Sounds no, you're, you're okay. Oh, okay. I Yeah, I didn't get any feedback there, so I jumped the gun. Okay, well, let's get going here. Uh, measurements of the LWA antenna and front end electronics is what I'm going to be talking about at this presentation. And um, if I can get my screen to advance, okay. Uh, and this is based on a paper that uh, I wrote with three other people um, earlier this year. And <clears throat> this, this is actually pretty good because uh, we went to great lengths to make sure that this was not hidden behind a paywall. So you can download the paper um, at archive.org for nothing. And um, I can post this link in the chat uh, toward the end of the presentation if you need it. So this was a joint effort um, that included me, Chris DeLulo, Brian Hicks, and Jay Stow. And <clears throat> those other three people are probably familiar names to you. If you've ever read any paper that concerns the LWA, the Long Wavelength Array, um, those those three guys are involved in it. And um, they invited me to participate in this uh, measurement effort uh, quite some time ago, probably a couple of years ago now. And um, uh, so this presentation then is, I'm, I'm gonna cover the technicalities, procedures and results of our measurements. I'm not gonna cover any of the instrumental effects, uh, the science aspects uh, and, that are described in, the, uh, in that paper. Uh, I can refer you to the other fellows that uh, are more expert on that kind of thing than I am. So the motivation was um, to take into account that the LWA antenna, the front end electronics are not perfect. And uh, so we know that there, there are impedance mismatches in the um, in the interface between the antenna and the front end electronics or the FEE. So um, in order to quantify those, uh, the impedance mismatch, then we decided we needed to make some measurements. And uh, so the this impedance mismatch or IMM is a uh, one of the required corrections for sky survey data. And it's also um, important in understanding the ongoing uh, uh, global redshifted 21 centimeter signal experiments that have to do with the so-called cosmic dawn. Now the long wavelength array um, is uh, presently, there's three of them in New Mexico and uh, the, the usable frequency range is advertised as 10 to 88 megahertz. Um, it is a galactic noise dominated system in other words, the uh, the galactic background radiation is uh, more powerful than the noise produced by the antenna and front end electronics itself. There's a uh, 256 antennas per station. 
Now, the first station was built uh, adjacent to the uh, very large array in New Mexico uh, called LWA-1, and that went online in 2011. A second station was built at Sevieta National Wildlife Re uh, Refuge in uh, 2016, and um, a third one, LWA North Arm, is actually under construction right now as I speak. And uh, I, in fact, I have one one picture of of the uh, LWA NA that I'll show later. Now, there's additional uh, long wavelength arrays being built in Texas and Arizona, uh, in the USA, and also in Peru. So a lot of the work that I've been doing is supporting uh, those those efforts. Now, just because the um, uh, the antenna and FEE are used in large, relatively large arrays, 256 antennas. That doesn't mean that it doesn't work in smaller applications. And in fact, the, uh, the LWA antenna and the FEE have found many applications in smaller arrays of 8 to 16 antennas, 4, 8, and 16 antennas, as well as single antenna installations. So um, these smaller arrays or uh, in installations uh, have a wide variety of applications. Lightning research, uh, there's actually, it's quite popular for that. Um, meteor radio emissions research. Now this is uh, radio that is actually, uh, radio emissions that are emitted by a meteor itself, not reflections but this is uh, generated by the meteor when it's uh, burning up in the atmosphere. By static radar experiments, um, I use, uh, I have two LWA antennas here in Alaska. Actually, I have three of them. And uh, two of them I use for HARP by static radar experiments, which we just completed a big uh, research campaign last week that included by static radar experiments. So here's some of the uh, small installations around the world. These are ones that I've been involved in one way or another. And uh, you can see that they're scattered uh, pretty much everywhere. Um, not too much going on up here in, uh, in Russia. Um, not too much going on uh, in Africa or South America, but uh, pretty much everywhere else. And the farthest north installation is way up here in Nunavut. Um, I think it's uh, latitude 77 degrees, and uh, the farthest south is down here at Marion Island, um, ha about halfway between South Africa and Antarctica. And it turns out that both the farthest north and farthest south installations are uh, were built by the same people at McGill University. Now, as, as, in terms of the measurements that we're doing, um, I was asked to help with the uh, updating the, the front end electronics design, and we completed that in, in 2021. And then uh, as a result of measurements and work on that, then we decided to make a complete set of scattering parameter measurements of several antennas in New Mexico and of uh, a bunch of FEEs as well. Now, the scattering parameters are the reflection coefficients, S1, 1, S2, 2, and transmission coefficients, S2, 1, and S1, 2. Now, the S1, 1, or the uh, equivalent to return loss, or SWR, of the, uh, of the dipoles was previously modeled and used in simulations, but there had been no direct measurements until we, had make, we made the measurements in 2023. And when I learned that, I was actually pretty surprised because the first LWA installation went in service in 2011, but nobody had actually measured any of this stuff. So it was quite a surprise to me. And uh, and actually, I was um, uh, really lucky to be asked to, to get involved in this. So the reflection coefficients, um, they're equivalent to return loss and or standing wave ratio. And so our, our goal there was to derive frequency dependence impedance mismatch factor. And that you know, impedance mismatch match factor then would, would fall into um, the actual measured data uh, 
to, to correct it for uh, uh, reflections. <clears throat> now the IMF or impedance mismatch factor represents the fraction of power that's passed through the antenna FEE interface and not reflected back. So this is the actual um, galactic or celestial emission, emissions that are passed through the system to the uh, receiver. Now the transmission coefficient, um, we didn't really require that for the impedance mismatch factor uh, corrections. But while we're on site making the measurements, it was convenient to go ahead and do these measurements anyway. So what we did is we measured the uh, transmission coefficients or the cross polarization coupling of each dipole in several antennas. So each antenna consists of a cross dipole. And uh, so these measurements were for the uh, coupling between the two dipoles, which are at right angles to each other. And while we were there, it was also convenient to uh, do some quick uh, two antenna experiments where we would couple our uh, network analyzer to one dipole in one antenna and the other port on the network analyzer would go to the um, to a, a dipole on another antenna and we'd measure the coupling between the two. So here's a line drawing of the LWA antenna. And uh, there's a lot of names that have been given to this tide fork, dipole, blade antennas, wing antennas, and so on. And you can see that um, the, the dipole elements are triangular in shape, uh, a, a tide fork, uh, these are metal elements. And so there's one dipole would be here where my cursor is moving. And then the cross dipole or the other dipole would be where my cursor is moving there. In fact, I'm gonna turn on my laser pointer. So here's one dipole and here's another dipole and the front end electronics is mounted in a plastic uh, box up at the very top of the, uh, of the antenna. Now the front end electronics um, is actually a relatively simple device. It's also called an active ballon. And um, the, the dipole elements of any given, of, uh, of a given dipole are connected directly to um, 50 ohm amplifiers. These are mimic type amplifiers on the printed circuit board. And then these are coupled with a 180 degree hybrid coupler. And uh, we take the delta output from the hybrid coupler, filter it, uh, uh, apply another 50 ohm amplifier to that, and then out it goes. And uh, so that's the uh, uh, simple block diagram on the left. On the right is uh, a, a rendering of the uh, printed circuit board itself. And you can see it's really not that complicated. The uh, dipole elements connect to these uh, larger rings on the uh, left and right and top and bottom of the, uh, of the board. And this 180 degree hybrid coupler is located right here in the middle. And uh, that's what converts the balanced dipole to a uh, unbalanced SMA connector uh, for the output of this device. Now this uh, image that I'm showing on the right is the version two uh, FEE. That was the one that Brian Hicks and I worked on. And uh, uh, that's actually in production now. But all of our measurements are, we're on the version 1.8 uh, FEE, which uh, from a distance looks identical to the version two. It's just that we made some improvements in the um, how it works uh, in uh, lightning type areas. Now here's a schematic of the FEE. Uh, this is the version two. Um, again, it's very similar in a lot of ways to the version 1.8. And uh, in fact, the measurements came out pretty much the same as uh, the version two and version 1.8 were pretty much the same. Now, when we were um, trying to work out how to make these measurements, 
uh, we decided to produce uh, cus custom calibration fixtures. And the purpose of these uh, calibration fixtures was to de-embed the, um, oops, I goofed up there. Sorry about that. I hit end instead of page down. So I have to manually go back through all of this. Okay, so if you look at the um, at the drawing here, we have a balanced dipole, and uh, we need to connect an unbalanced uh, network analyzer to that. So we have to de-embed this hybrid coupler, and so that's what we we spent a lot of time on. That in fact, we spent months and months working on that. We ended up producing a couple of versions of calibration fixtures. And the purpose of those fixtures was to ship the, uh, the, the network analyzer reference plane to the antenna feed points. We were gonna, uh, we plan to make the uh, three sets of S parameter measurements uh, for a single dipole or a single antenna, dipole to dipole, and for two antennas, and also the FEE. So we did all the uh, measurements in New Mexico in November of 2022, and then I did the FEE measurements in my lab here in Anchorage in uh, February of 2023. And we did all of the measurements from five to 200 megahertz. Now, if you go back and, and remember that earlier slide, I said that the, the usable frequency range was 10 to uh, approximately 88 megahertz. Well, we, we know that the antenna works really well below 10 megahertz. And we kind of suspected that it probably would work pretty well above 88 megahertz. So we extended that frequency range a little bit. Now the calibration fixtures look exactly like the FEE, exactly like the front end, front end electronics, the um, the form factor, the shape, the dimensions, the via locations, and so on, were, are identical to the FEE. And um, also includes a hybrid coupler here, which we're trying to de-embed. And then out here at the end of these traces where the dipoles would connect, we put our calibration standards. Uh, uh, zero ohm for a short, empty pads for an open, and then paralleled 100 ohm resistors for the 50 ohm load. <clears throat> and then we, um, for the through calibration, we put two of the, uh, we made up some test fixtures, which I'll show you here in a second. We made up two test fixtures and put them, uh, installed them back to back. And that gave us a through measurement for uh, uh, the calibration. Now these, these um, the FEEs are dual assemblies. So there's two FEEs, uh, printed circuit boards that are uh, screwed together and um, mounted back to back and they're exactly the same as each other. They're identical except for uh, the direction that the uh, SMA connector points on the uh, board. So here's a schematic then of the of our custom calibration fixtures, and uh, here's the hybrid coupler. Here's our connection for the uh, network analyzer, and then we have these uh, uh, surface mount pads for uh, equipping with e equipping with zero ohm or hundred ohm resistors, and uh, or just leaving them empty for the for the open. Now, we're actually coupling to the, uh, the, the dipoles during the measurements, we had to make an uh, antenna test fixture. And so that's what's shown uh, over here on the right. And you, when you look at that, you can say, well, that looks almost exactly the same as the calibration fixtures. And in fact, it is in all respects, except that the traces from the hybrid coupler here in the middle um, are extended all the way to the dipole connections, which are the large rings uh, on the left and right. 
And uh, th again, this is a dual assembly. And so uh, we make a set of measurements, say on the dipole here, and then we um, rotate this around and make um, a measure set of measurements for the, uh, the other dipole. There are no components on these traces other than the, uh, the hybrid coupler. And uh, the only other thing is a termination resistor for the sum port on the hybrid coupler and then an SMA connector. So, and this is a schematic of, the, uh, of that test fixture. And by the way, all of these, um, uh, the FEE design, the test fixtures and calib uh, calibration fixtures are all open source. We did the design in KiCad, uh, which is an open source um, PCB design program. And uh, all of this is on, on GitHub and available for anybody to, to use and modify to their own purposes. Now, when we made the antenna measurements, um, I used a, uh, for field measurements, I used my Keysight 99, N9917A field fox. And this is a, actually a microwave analyzer. Uh, it's got almost everything but the kitchen sink in it. And um, uh, so I, for the measurements, I put it in, in network analyzer mode. Um, it is capable of uh, doing full two port uh, S parameter measurements. And um, uh, out in the field, then we operated it on, on the internal battery. And it's got a real good battery and, and uh, pretty much lasted for a whole day's measurement. Now for the single antenna measurements um, where we were doing cross polarization measurements, we, uh, we did a two port calibration of the VNA and then connected uh, one of the ports on the VNA to one of the dipoles and the other port then connected to the to the other dipole. So these dipoles are at 90 degrees to each other and ideally there would be no coupling between the two, but in a in the practical world, uh, there there is some coupling. And I'll show you the measurements here in just a minute. So what uh, what came out of these measurements though is uh, not only did we do the coupling between the two two dipoles, but we also got the uh, reflection coefficients or impedance matching uh, matching measurements of the two of the two dipoles themselves. So these this set of measurements then uh, really killed two birds with one one stone. Now, when I was uh, uh, developing the test procedures to do these measurements, I uh, built an antenna here in my yard, and <clears throat> I had to. Um, build a kind of a, a fence around it because you can see the the ground screen here on the bottom and I didn't want the moose who live in my neighborhood to uh, trample this this ground screen so all I had to do is put some surveyor tape around it and uh, uh, kept them out of it but uh, these guys uh, came by one uh, morning early and checked it out and then moved on but um, having that uh, antenna in my yard, then I could uh, do a, a dry run, walk through the step-by-step uh, -step procedures for making these measurements. That way I wouldn't make a mistake when, when I got out in the field. So for two-port two -port calibration uh, of the uh, cross dipole measurements, then I used the, uh, the calibration fixtures that we made, the short, open, load, and through to calibrate the VNA and then um, hooked it up to a test fixture that um, uh, mounted on the antenna. So these, uh, these fixtures here would be mounted on the antenna during calibration, removed, and then replaced by a test fixture uh, in, in the um, uh, enclosure at the top of the antenna. So out in the field then, uh, this is what it looked like. Um, for the measurements. Here we have a, a test fixture mounted on the hub. And you can see the uh, in, in the very center of the test fixture, this is the hybrid coupler that we de-embedded uh, through our calibration of the VNA with the calibration fixtures. Um, not shown in this picture is Brian Hicks. 
Brian was uh, was integral to the team. Uh, we couldn't have lived without him. Uh, Jace Dowell on the left and Chris DeLulo on the right and uh, posing with an LWA antenna that, that Chris and I built in about 15 minutes on site. Now you can see a bunch of posts here in the background. And this was at uh, uh, LWA North Arm. This is out near the North Arm of the uh, very large array in New Mexico. And these posts are, are actually antenna masts that are waiting for the uh, the rest of the assembly to be put on them. And, and in fact, I think by now all of these posts have been, or, or all these masts have been populated by um, by the antennas at that site. And they're in the process of, of getting things commissioned uh, as I speak. So here's some measurements uh, of a single antenna. This is cross pole measurements. And in, it actually includes uh, the impedance mismatching uh, or reflection coefficient S11 and S22. Those fell out of the measurements. And, um, uh, but the, the important thing for the cross pole type measurements are S21 and S12. Now you look at this and you say, well, it's just a bunch of squiggly lines on a graph. Well, a lot of the, what we do in radio astronomy is squiggly lines on a graph. So, um, but if you look closely, you can see that the, the scale starts at a minus 20 dB. And um, from an average point of view, um, the, the coupling between the two blades or the two antennas is in the neighborhood of about 40 dB, a minus 40 dB. So that's pretty good isolation. Um, you probably can't do better than that with any kind of a dipole, a, a set of dipoles. And of course, there's going to people, there's people that are going to scoff at what I just said. But in reality, I don't uh, uh, think you're going to do much better than that. Now, these spikes that you see, I can't explain those. Um, they they look to me kind of like resonant um, action, but they could be radio frequency interference during our measurements. And <clears throat> if you look at um, here's LWA one. So this is near the VLA in New Mexico, and then Sevieta is over here on the right. And um, the shapes are different, but um, the, or the the details are different. But the the uh, general shape is the same uh, between these two antennas. So we have in the neighborhood of, of 40 dB cross polarization coupling between uh, the dipoles on a given antenna. Now for the antenna to antenna coupling measurements, we um, hooked up the VNA to uh, say one dipole on one antenna over here on the left, and then to another dipole on another antenna on the right. And the unused dipole or the, un, uh, the, the, the dipole that we weren't, were not measuring, we terminated with 50 ohms. So we ran two cables out to the antenna itself, uh, back to where the network analyzer was located. And these are, um, uh, just regular coaxial cables. I think we used LMR240 for those. And um, then on this one unused dipole, we uh, put a 50 ohm termination. So that that was the purpose of that was to replicate uh, an actual installation uh, as best we could in the field. So um, we connected to two nearby antennas and we call those X and Y. We then um, uh, did a measurement from antenna A to antenna A over here on the right, antenna A to antenna B, and so on. So there's a total of four measurements that were made uh, at each um, pair of antennas. And <clears throat> we what fell out of these measurements were S11 and S22, which are reflection coefficients. These are redundant measurements from what we had already already made 
but they were at no cost. So we, we took them. And uh, what we were really interested in was the S12 and S21, uh, which are the transmission coefficients between each of these dipoles. So the calibration then was um, not that laborious, but it was had to be done in a certain way. And these procedures had all been worked out beforehand. So we would calibrate um, the VNA um, with the short open load and through uh, uh, calibration fixtures that we made. And then uh, we'd, we'd do that for each port as shown here. We First we do port one and then we uh, would calibrate port two. And then we'd replace those calibration fixtures with the test fixture. And uh, oh yeah, we also had to do an unknown through uh, measurement uh, that couples port one to port two for calibration. And the only requirement on an unknown through is that S21 equals S12. In other words, the device is reciprocal. And uh, we made a bunch of measurements to prove that. And uh, yes, back-to-back uh, -back test fixtures were re reciprocal. So here's a picture. Um, uh, here's the VNA. We had a, a table set up out in the field, and um, uh, you can see the, the cables that go to the antennas. Uh, they are color-coded red and green. You can see uh, the two cables that were not being, that were, that, that were connected to dipoles not being measured, and these are 50-ohm uh, terminations on, on those cables there. And then this shows that uh, Chris is uh, installing, uh, looks like a uh, test fixture on the antenna. And when, after he had made the, uh, the connections and placed the fixture on the uh, enclosure here at the very top of the mast, then he had to move away, uh, away from the antenna because I noticed in the uh, network analyzer that um, while he was moving around close to the antenna, that the um, the measurements would change. So he moved about maybe four or five meters away. Now, as part of this procedure, um, we saved the uh, the measurements as S2P uh, touch tone uh, scattering parameter files. And I also saved a plot image of uh, every measurement too, just uh, as kind of a cross check. And that's what's shown on the right here is the, um, the image produced by the network analyzer itself. And you can see that uh, bec because this is on a, a relatively small screen, that there's not quite the resolution as the previous measurements uh, th that we had plotted show. So the um, S11 and S22, again, are reflection coefficients, a measure of the impedance matching or mismatching. And then S21 and S12 are transmission. So this is the coupling measurement here. Now on those antenna to antenna coupling measurements, um, what we did is we picked two antennas near the middle of the array. So this is an aerial shot of the um, antenna locations at LWA1. And you can see it's uh, kind of an oblong shape. And we picked these two antennas. These were just a, an, an arbitrary, um, we, we picked that we didn't, think about it. We just walked out into the rain and said, oh, let's just do these two here. Now, <clears throat> one of the things that, that we do know, though, is that if we had picked, say, this antenna and this antenna, or that, or that, or that, that these measurements would be different because the, um, the, the dipoles would have different relative um, positioning. So um, we just grabbed these two antennas. We just wanted to see what we were going to get out of these measurements. And uh, so I'll show you those in just a second. Uh, for the, for the um, dipole to dipole measurements, we picked an antenna out at the edge of the array for that. So that's LWA1 uh, near the uh, very large array. <clears throat> 
And then this is the Sevieta location. And uh, you can see it's roughly the same shape. And we just walked out and said, okay, let's just do these antennas to these two antennas here. And then we, for the dipole measurements, we did um, an antenna out on the edge like that. <clears throat> so for antenna to antenna coupling, um, we came up with these plots here. And you can see that in general, the shapes are pretty much the same, but there are some details that are different uh, depending on the um, actual antenna pair. Now, the reason that we wanted to make these coupling measurements, um, nobody had done these before. And there has been, there had been a lot of uh, uh, people that said, yeah, you need to take this into account when you uh, do your calibrations of the uh, sky surveys and, and that kind of a thing. And um, everybody talked about how this should be done, but it turned out that nobody would actually do that until we went out in November of last year to do these measurements. So um, again, these plots start at a minus 30 dB uh, relative coupling between antennas. And you can see that the, the average uh, coupling is in the neighborhood of 30, maybe 35 dB between those two adjacent antennas. And like I mentioned earlier now, if we had made a measurement of a different pair of antennas, then uh, these, these measurements probably would have been different as well. So these were uh, antennas that were close to each other. I think uh, within, uh, I think the closest spacing of the antennas in the LWAs are 5.3 meters. And uh, so these uh, two antennas that we picked here are maybe five, six, seven meters apart. So uh, that that's LWA1, and then this is LWA2. And as I flip back and forth, you can see that there are some differences between those uh, antennas, and, and we kind of expected that because um, the, the spacing of the antennas and their orientation of the uh, dipoles elements themselves would change how that looks. But you can see that in general, we have about a, a 30 dB, maybe 35 dB coupling loss between any of the pair antenna pairs. Now for the FEE measurements, um, I did those in, in my lab here in Anchorage. I used a, a Copper Mountain Technologies M5045 VNA. Now, this is a wonderful instrument. And um, it's uh, what they call metrolo metrology grade, which uh, means that it's super uh, accurate once it's been cal cal calibrated. And now for port one, when I was making the FEE measurements, this would be um, the... Uh, for the input to the FEE, measuring the uh, reflection loss of the input of the FEE. What I did there is I used a little trick that I picked up from Brian Walker at, Ky at Copper Mountain Technologies. And uh, so what, what I did is I used an automatic calibration module to measure the custom calibration fixtures. So in other words, I made first I made a measurement of the calibration fixtures themselves and save that uh, characterization data, and then use those S parameters as what are called database standards for actually measuring the FEE input. So um, uh, the advantage of an auto automatic calibration module is that it they are individually characterized. And um, so it's not an average of a thousand mechanical calibration standards. It's individually characterized, so that means your, your VNA calibration is going to be much better than uh, using mechanical calibration standards. So that was for uh, um, measuring the uh, calibration fixtures and getting that out of the way. Only had to make those measurements once, and then um, that is used to uh, de-embed the calibration fixtures, including the test cables, the hybrid coupler, PCB traces, and the um, short open load calibration standards on those calibration fixtures. 
Now for port two, uh, that's the output of the VNA. Uh, we weren't uh, um, too worried about that. Uh, so in this case, I used just a regular old uh, mechanical calibration uh, set that um, uh, I had in, in on hand. Now all of my equipment is, uh, when these measurements are made, we're, we're in current calibration. So there's no question of that. Um, this um, mechanical calibration standard set over here on the right, you can see there's a three and a half inch floppy disk there. So this thing dates way back uh, to, I don't know how many years ago, but um, it's still uh, a viable uh, set of calibration standards. So this calibration then de-embeds the test cables and bias T in the FEE test fixture, which I'll show you here in just a second. Now, this uh, looks like somewhat complicated drawing, but, um, uh, and, and I'll try to walk you through this. Uh, we have the network analyzer over here on the left, and then the uh, FEE test fixture on the right, down here on the lower right. And inside of that test fixture, there's a bias T so that we can couple 15 volts to the front end electronics that were un that's under test. So that's the, the device under test is shown in, in uh, blue. And our um, the test fixture includes a, uh, a hybrid coupler. So what we did then is we calibrated the uh, we use the calibration fixtures that have been characterized previously with the AutoCal module and use those to um, connect the open, short, and load and calibrate the uh, port one of the VNA. Now, we use proxy cables um, because I didn't want to uh, disassemble the test fixture for every measurement. So what I did is... Um, uh, got an identical cable, a set of cables that were used in the test fixture and then used those as proxies. And uh, we did our calibration then. And then um, here's a, a, a picture of the uh, test fixture itself. It has three bays uh, or two bays, including the top cover. Here's the bottom bay with um, uh, the bias T over here on the right and power components and filtering on the left. And here's the, uh, uh, the coupler pre, uh, printed circuit board used in the test fixture. And so this is um, uh, roughly equivalent to the uh, test fixture that we used in the field, but this one is mounted inside of a, a metal box with a hybrid coupler and then a connector for connecting to the uh, uh, unbalanced side of it. And then this cable then connects to the to the uh, FEE itself. It's just a picture of, uh, of uh, one of the uh, FEEs under test. So as part of these measurements, I did, did a complete set of um, uh, S11, S22, and so on. Uh, and this is just an image of, of one of the plots that comes with the, uh, that came out of the Copper Mountain Technologies VNA. So I'm just showing S11 for one side of one FEE. Now I did measurements on 10 uh, FEEs so we could get uh, some limited statistics out of that. And this, uh, uh, these plots here are the S11, S21 and so on for 10, this is the average of uh, 10 FEEs. And the, uh, the dotted red line is the one sigma boundary, the, the black line in the middle, uh, that is the uh, average of those 10. So um, we expected some variations and what we saw um, and, and that are plotted here are pretty much what we expected to see. Now, all of those measurements then had to be uh, put into, into something. And uh, so uh, originally, now way back when they used um, uh, a model of the antenna to calculate what they called an impedance mismatch efficiency. Um, and that's shown over here on the uh, this equation on the upper right. 
Now, this, this uh, assumes that the FEE is perfectly balanced, uh, 100 ohm across those two dipole ports. Now, this isn't realistic. Um, we know now it's not re realistic. So what we did is uh, took into account the, um, the reflection coefficient of the antenna as well as the reflection coefficient of the FEE itself. And uh, so this um, uh, impedance, what we're calling impedance mismatch factor then reduces to the impedance mismatch efficiency uh, when you have a perfectly matched uh, uh, reflection coefficient for the FEE um, over here. So now um, all of this stuff came together and uh, the results are shown here. So this is the impedance mismatch factor as calculated from our measurements. And uh, shown here in these plots is a green trace. And that green trace is the model that they had used previously. So you can see that the model is actually pretty good uh, compared to field measurements of the uh, antennas themselves, of the antennas and FEE. So um, that's pretty encouraging. And uh, the model only went out to 100 megahertz, whereas our measurements, we continued on out to 200 measurements, uh, 200 megahertz. Now, a perfectly uh, uh, matched would be uh, a 1.0, no match at all would be a zero down here. So those are the results that we got um, out, of the, uh, out of the measurements. So in summary then, we built up uh, custom calibration uh, and custom test fixtures. We had those fabricated, uh, their uh, uh, regular printed circuit boards. And the purpose of those was to de-embed the effects of that hybrid coupler in the FEE. And then uh, we made the uh, actual measurements in the field on uh, LWA antenna uh, in New Mexico and also on front end electronics. And then we um, used that new impedance mismatch factor from the previous calculation. And that's um, uh, being applied to the sky survey calibrations that they're doing with the actual LWAs. So these new improve, uh, corrections then did show an improvement over previous ones. Um, and they gave us a more physical looking spectrum um, from the uh, LWA measurements themselves. So that's pretty much all I've got. And I'll be glad to take some questions if, if there are any.